So first, what is my book about? Um, so within historical scholarship, there is a lot more written about, hate, about how Asian exclusion in the United States began. So starting with the 1875 Page Law, the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, and there's less written about how it ended. Um, so by 1924, US Congress had enacted laws barring Asians from immigrating and naturalizing in the United States. And my book tracks what I call a trans movement of Asians, Asian Americans, white American elites and others who lobbied US Congress for repeal between 1943 and 1965. And so the book, um, it starts with the repeal of the China's exclusion laws during World War II, and it ends with the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act, which overhauls the immigration system, as many of us know, um, and is the law that admitted my parents, and I suspect maybe, <laughs> maybe some of yours, um, and which remains in some ways the basis of law today. So framed perhaps most broadly, the question the book tackles is, you know, a more straightforward one. It's how does the US go from being a nation that excludes Asians from immigration and citizenship to one that today receives more immigrants from Asia than from any other country in the world or any other place in the world? Um, and Asians stay are the fastest growing racial group due to immigration. And as of about 10 years ago, more immigrants come to the US from Asia than from anywhere else in the world. And the short answer really is, in answer to this question, the short answer is it wasn't on purpose, <laughs> as, as is true for many uh, episodes in US immigration history. Um, historians talk amongst ourselves and in our work a lot about unintended consequences. Um, and the history of repeal really underscores the disconnect between what people thought was going to happen or the intent behind the laws and what actually did happen or the impact of the laws. And that's perhaps one of the big, biggest, but you know, most important ironies of this history. It's that for the majority of the people who fought for repeal, including most Asian Americans, in fact, um, the goal of repeal wasn't, so the goal of repeal wasn't meaningful Asian immigration to the United States, which is what ends up happening. Um, instead, I look at how repeal advocates, they seized upon repeal measures and legislation as instruments to achieve other goals. So as means to different ends. And my book looks at how different groups of people used repeal toward very different ends. So for white elites, you know, you have stories of white um, missionaries or what David Hollinger would call missionary kids and other missionary connected Americans um, taking up repeal as a foreign policy uh, tool. For Asian colonial officials, which um, is kind of one of the big thrusts of my book, I look at Indian and Philippine colonial officials and how they actually take up repeal measures in Washington, D.C. Um, in service of their own nation and state building projects at home. So Filipino officials, uh, they support a naturalization bill in order to court Filipinos in the US because they want Filipino dollars in the form of remittances. And for Indian colonial officials, I look at how they fight for Indian American rights um, kind of as part of a general project they have of fighting against the mistreatment of Indians across the British Commonwealth. And so it's part of a larger project. Um, but it's also part of an Indian independence project, which I'll talk a little bit about um, hopefully later. For Asians in the US who are involved with the repeal movement, there's a wide range of motivations and agenda. And that's not to say that there weren't those folks who fought for these legislation in pursuit of legal inclusion. So kind of a more traditional understanding um, of, of ethnic inclusion, uh, Japanese American Citizens League, Indian Americans, but even for them, I look at how there is this tension between the immigration and naturalization pieces of the law. So one thing that I think folks um, don't think a lot about, but I, I tried to think through, it's before 1924 and the 1924 Immigration Act, immigration and naturalization law are largely separate bodies. They're kind of, you know, they, they evolve independently, largely of each other. There are moments of intersection, but they largely evolve separately. But it's the 1924 Immigration Act that entangles the two, immigration and naturalization, with real consequences for advocates had to go about lobbying. And these questions, you know, in naturalization and immigration, both are ultimately about who gets to be an American, but in different ways. So for naturalization, you have, right, it often is seen as an internal question. So who gets to be part of the American body politic? Whereas immigration is an external question that involves not just US officials and US um, lawmakers, but also other people <laughs> from outside the United States, other countries. Um, and so it becomes this external question of kind of who gets to be here. 
And the reality was that even folks who were more interested in the naturalization piece, which was many Asian Americans, they still had to contend with the immigration and foreign policy piece just because of the way the laws were written. Because in order to get the exclusion laws repealed, you not only had to deal with naturalization, you also had to deal with immigration because they were entangled by the 24 Immigration Act. Um, in terms of how important some of these constituencies are, so at the end of the day, it's Congress, right, that makes the decisions about exclusion. And so you have all these different constituencies lobbying US Congress. I um, mean, one question I've gotten and that folks have asked is kind of, to what extent do Asian and Asian American actors make a difference? Are they kind of window dressing in this campaign? Which is oftentimes I think how, is how they've been talked about in previous, um, in the little work that's been done. So it's ultimately different in each case, but it's been really interesting. Um, in the Indian case, for example, it's actually the Indian agent general to the, to the United States. So effectively a de facto ambassador who rescues the Indian Immigration and Naturalization Bill, the Lou Seller Bill, from dying in House Committee by getting the British government to endorse it, right? So it's, there are many actors involved. And again, when we think about these early repeal measures, I must say the early repeal measures, we're talking about Chinese exclusion repeal, the Lou Seller Act, the McCarran-Walter Act. I mean, these are largely symbolic measures, as many of us know. So when we talk about immigration quotas, we're talking about quotas, between 100 and 185 per year, right? So it's not as if this is kind of a real opening of the United States to Asian immigration quite yet. That doesn't really happen until 65. But again, that wasn't necessarily the ultimate goal of a lot of people who were involved. So where does the empire piece come in? So what makes their appeals politically viable? Because after all, it's not like people hadn't already been lobbying to repeal Asian exclusion. So um, a very rich literature on Chinese exclusion has looked at Chinese Americans, Chinese officials, white missionaries, other white advocates who for years, even State Department officials, who for years are lobbying to overturn or end Chinese exclusion on various different grounds. So they've been lobbying for years, but their appeals largely fall on deaf ears. So what changes? What changes during World War II and after is what the US is doing in Asia. And so as many of us who study um, this period know, right? This is the period of incredible US intervention in Asia. And this book, I, the book argues that repeal is basically the price of US post-war empire in Asia, part of the cost of America's informal empire across the continent. And here I build um, upon a lot of great scholarship um, done by Takashi Fujitani, Simeon Mann and others who trace the shift from kind of a more formal empire, right? Formal empires with colonial governments, kind of like in the Philippines the shift from a formal empire to an informal empire in Asia. Um, so it's not that the US, it's not that US empire ends, it's just that it changes form. And this informal empire was different because you needed buy-in or at least some level of consent or cooperation from the peoples that you're trying to, that you're trying to control. So if the people you're trying to get buy-in from are saying, please stop being racist and stop supporting European imperialists like the British, then now US lawmakers are incentivized, right, to listen. And this is an interest convergence argument. So this is kind of the backdrop to the story I'm trying to tell. So again, this gives rise to this new power dynamic whereby even as the US grows in power, the demands of building and sustaining US empire in Asia forces US officials to be more responsive to the anti-racist and anti-colonial demands of non-white peoples, if only in the most symbolic and performative ways. So with greater power came great paying greater vulnerability on the part of the United States. And supporters of repeal really exploited this. And one of the main things I'm really interested in then um, is about how historically marginalized peoples are able to instrumentalize or leverage US global power and US imperial interests for their own purposes. Uh, and that's really you know, the thrust of the larger book. How did these different groups of folks leverage and instrumentalize US power and US imperial interests? Um, and in the process, right, the repeal movement lasts, I argue, from about 1940 to 1965, as I mentioned earlier. And so in the process of lobbying for repeal, I look at how the movement intersects with two other contemporaneous developments. So on the one hand, right, I talked about uh, the Indian and Philippine independence movements and how repeal became entangled with these anti-colonial movements that were already, um, that had already been in existence. And then on the other hand, within the United States, I look at how advocates of repeal and immigration activists in general um, had to contend or they found themselves oftentimes vying against black civil rights activists in Washington DC. Because again, the common factor in 
all of many of these movements is US Congress, right? It's the same lawmakers that folks are lobbying for change and they needed the support of the same um, senators and Republican Congress people. So I think what I'll do is maybe I'll stop there. So I didn't get to talk, I guess, enough, or I didn't get to talk about kind of the larger roots of the project. Maybe I'll just say one thing. Um, the pieces that got left out, so this book began as a dissertation, um, as many of our first books do. Um, and the dissertation actually had significant chapters on Korea and Korean Americans, because Korea is a really interesting case. Um, and that, those chapters really built on my undergraduate thesis written, um, it's my senior essay at Yale, written under Mary Lou. I won't repeat the title because it's embarrassing, but it traced, it traced the lobbying efforts of Korean Americans for immigration and naturalization rights during World War II. And all these years later, what's really interesting is when I look back, um, two central themes of the book that really started or originated in, the, in my college thesis and shaped my, my thinking from the very beginning, uh, the two themes I think that have remained kind of a through line is number one, the centrality of US global power. And then number two, the centrality of colonialism and empire um, to Asian American advocacy and these campaigns for change. And it's just interesting that so many of the arguments that Korean Americans um, were making for repeal were echoed by Indians in the United States, as well as Indians in India, and as well as Filipino Americans and Filipinos in the Philippines. And so it's a really interesting um, for me, making those connections and realizing that the germs the kind of the seeds of my thinking began so long ago has been really, um, it's been really interesting to think about. Um, and so I guess what I'll do is I'll stop there. And then if folks have questions about any of the things I mentioned, um, I'll be happy to answer them later.